we are back again talking about gestational trophoblastic disease. We're going to talk now about the malignant forms of GTD, which generally uh, come after the benign GTD, which is the, uh, the molar pregnancy. So this is also called gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, indicating that this is more of a tumor, like a cancer, uh, rather than a benign process. Okay. So here we're going to talk about the persistent slash invasive mole. Uh, we'll just call it the uh, persistent mole. Choriocarcinoma and the placental site trophoblastic tumor, which is pretty rare. So out of the gestational trophoblastic disease, if you take a cross-section of the population that has GTD in general, 25% will have malignant GTD. Most malignant GTDs will follow a complete molar pregnancy. Only a minority will follow a partial molar pregnancy. And that said, partial molar pregnancy is much more rare than complete molar pregnancy, but complete molar pregnancy has more of a predilection to uh, become a malignant form. Okay, so we had our patient here and let's say that she has a complete molar pregnancy. We're following her up. We've done the DNC. We're following her up with weekly HCG levels, waiting for it to come down into the normal range down here. And she's progressing just fine, staying within that mean. And suddenly she has an HCG level that plateaus and now is rising again. What does this mean? it means she has a persistent mole, and we consider that to be malignant disease. Okay? So malignant GTD, about 50% occurs within months to a year after a molar pregnancy. So most of these cases uh, will come after a molar pregnancy. 25% occur after a miscarriage, an elective abortion, or an ectopic pregnancy. My inclination here is that these weren't normal pregnancies to begin with. They were molar pregnancies, particularly in the case of a miscarriage, that these were probably partial moles that miscarried and was never diagnosed. Um, same with the elective abortion or ectopic pregnancy, uh, but I'm not sure on that. 25% uh, can occur after a normal pregnancy, which uh, I'm not sure how that happens. Most malignant GTDs that follow a molar pregnancy are going to be the persistent or invasive GTD, um, and then those that follow a non-molar pregnancy are usually choriocarcinoma, and this is because uh, the complete molar pregnancy, which is uh, the most likely to turn into, into malignant GTD, is very much associated uh, with a higher predilection to develop the persistent or invasive GTD. Uh, and so that's probably the reason behind that. So how do we stage this? This is going to be important in determining treatment. So stage one, confined to the uterus. Stage two means that there's metastases to the pelvis or to the vagina. Stage three is metastasis to the lung. That's the most common site of metastasis for all the malignant gestational trophoblastic diseases. And stage four is distant metastasis, which can be to the brain, liver, and other organs. So the persistent invasive mole is the most common manifestation of malignant gestational trophoblastic disease. When it occurs, it almost always follows the evacuation of a molar pregnancy. So a woman who has a molar pregnancy, we do the DNC, we're following her up with serial weekly HCGs, and rather than her HCGs returning to normal, like it should within about 14 weeks uh, with a uh, complete molar pregnancy, it plateaus at some point and possibly even rises. That is diagnostic of a persistent or invasive mole. A complete mole is more likely to turn into persistent mole than is a partial mole. About 15% of complete moles will go on to become persistent uh, invasive moles, and only about 5% of partial moles will do that. There's a wide range in the literature as far as uh, how many go on to become what. The clinical presentation, there's really not a whole lot of physical signs, not a whole lot of symptoms. Usually you'll diagnose this based on, like we already said, the HCG plateau on follow-up. 
The most common symptom when there is one is abnormal uterine bleeding. That's rather nonspecific. Physical examination is typically normal. These are invasive moles. They're within the myometrium. Uh, so you're not going to feel a whole lot. The uterus might be slightly enlarged, but you're not going to get a whole lot in physical exam. Diagnosis is pretty simple. HCG levels plateau as you're following up a woman for uh, uh, molar pregnancy. And pelvic sonography will also be your friend in diagnosing this. When you diagnose a persistent mole, you want to get a baseline chest x-ray. That's to see if there's any uh, metastasis to the lungs. Uh, because if the woman goes on to develop pulmonary symptoms, you want to know uh, if this was there to begin with. You get a chest x-ray, you can see if the tumor had, differentiate whether the tumor had metastasized before you started the treatment versus if it had metastasized after you started the treatment. Other imaging tests can be done as suspected. If you diagnose this as, as uh, metastatic invasive mole, uh, if, if you diagnose this as metastatic, you'll want to get an x-ray of, uh, sorry, a CT or MRI of the head as well as the abdomen and pelvis. The treatment is chemotherapy. So we base the treatment on whether the patient is low risk or high risk. Don't worry about knowing whether the woman is low risk or high risk. This is how it's done. There's a FIGO score, federa uh, it's the French, uh, but it basically stands for International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. And they do this score uh, based on risk factors, uh, who's going to respond better to methotrexate alone uh, versus uh, who won't. And it's a score. If, it, if the score comes out greater than 6, uh, then it's high risk. If it's less than 6, then it's low risk. Okay, so if they're low risk, they can take methotrexate alone. That has some advantages because methotrexate alone is not going to cause hair loss and all these other symptoms uh, or side effects that uh, combination chemotherapy can. So low risk is a single agent chemotherapy with methotrexate. High risk is going to get multi-agent chemotherapy and that's going to be methotrexate, dactinomycin, and etoposide. Some, uh, th this is not a this is not set in stone. Uh, different uh, doctors will use different uh, regimens. Uh, another regimen can be with five different drugs, uh, adding on to these three, Oncovin and Cyclophosphamide, the EMACO uh, regimen. As you follow these women up, it's basically the same as how you follow up a woman with a benign GTD. You're going to continue monitoring with serial HCGs every week until it's normal for three consecutive weeks. Then you get monthly HCGs for a year. Uh, now, that's a little bit different than following up benign disease. With benign disease, you just get monthly HCGs for six months. Here we do it for a year. Uh, contraception, same recommendations. Uh, until the HCGs are normalized, you want to use barrier contraception. And then once they're normalized and you're doing your follow-up uh, monthly, uh, you can use hormonal contraception. Uh, and then that should be continued for at least a year, but probably longer. And the reason for that is that a woman should avoid pregnancy for at least one year after finishing chemotherapy because there are some there, there is an association between methotrexate and, uh, and congenital defects uh, of, of the fetus. Uh, so usually a woman will want to avoid pregnancy for one year after finishing chemotherapy. So once she's done with the methotrexate, uh, she wants to go one year without becoming pregnant. All right. So that's that risk assessment I was talking about. Don't worry about it remembering this. Uh, one thing though that you should recognize is that if a woman has, is not responding to methotrexate then you'll want to do multi-agent chemotherapy. And essentially our, uh, the response to chemotherapy is going to be based on uh, the HCG level and its normalization. Okay the next form of malignant GTD is the choriocarcinoma. This one is much more rare. Uh, and this is a malignancy of placental tissue. Uh, so this is a malignant necrotizing tumor which consists both of cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts and there is no apparent organization of placental villi on histology. Uh, 
In general, choriocarcinoma can occur in the testes in a man and in the ovaries in a woman. We talked about this tumor when we talked about the ovarian tumors. Uh, but choriocarcinoma is most commonly derived from actual fetal placental tissue. Uh, the mechanism is a little different when it occurs in the ovary or testes. Uh, so gestational related choriocarcinoma is most common. Uh, when you look on histology, the cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts will not be organized well into placental villi. They'll be anaplastic. You'll see multiple mitotic figures. Uh, this is a tumor that very easily invades the, uh, the myometrium and uh, even past the, uh, the external wall of the uterus and can also invade the uterine vasculature and hence uh, will uh, very easily metastasize and most often it presents in the metastatic stage. Uh, this is a very bloody tumor and that makes sense because the placenta is a very bloody organ. If you've ever delivered a placenta after, uh, after delivering a baby, you know it's an extremely bloody tissue. When the placenta delivers, there's a, little, there's a gush of blood. If you've ever done a C-section, it's a very bloody surgery. That blood comes from the placenta. The point of the placenta is vascular exchange. Uh, so there's lots and lots of vasculature in the choriocarcinoma, and that will help you distinguish this on a uh, son sonogram. It is a rare tumor, approximately 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 40,000 pregnancies in the U.S. will be associated with a choriocarcinoma. However, it's much more common in the developing world. In Africa, it happens to be one of the leading causes of cancer in women. So this can occur during a pregnancy. It can occur after a pregnancy. And it may also even be associated with a normal pregnancy. So a pregnancy that is not associated with any gestational trophoblastic disease, the placenta may develop a tumor, uh, which is a choriocarcinoma. So that is possible. Uh, but it most commonly is associated with gestational trophoblastic disease, major risk factor for developing choriocarcinoma. The clinical presentation is late postpartum bleeding, so a woman who's bleeding more than six to eight weeks after she delivers. It often presents in the metastatic stage, as I mentioned, so there may be other associated systemic symptoms. If it invades the lungs, there can be cough, dyspnea, respiratory distress, hemoptysis. If it invades the brain, it can be associated with headache, dizziness, and other symptoms uh, that correlate with a spice-occupying lesion. There can be GI symptoms, and this can also metastasize to the vagina, which is going to uh, result in a very vascular mass that easily bleeds, and that leads to vaginal bleeding. On physical exam, you may note uterine enlargement, as well as signs of metastatic disease. You may note a uh, vaginal mass. Because the choriocarcinoma has uh, syncytiotrophoblastic cells, it produces HCG. This will be associated with a high HCG, and hence it can cause uh, bilateral fecal lutein cysts, which you may see on sonography. And then you may also note neurologic signs, uh, such as a papilledema on physical examination. To diagnose this, the best first test when you suspect it is an HCG level, which you would probably already be getting, you should already be getting, if you're following a woman up uh, after D, uh, DNC with, uh, with the benign gestational trophoblastic disease. Uh, so you may note the, the uh, plateau or uh, peaking of the, uh, of the HCG level. Uh, however, if you suspect this in a woman you're not following up, then HCG level is the best test, and the HCG level will be elevated. You're going to follow this up by pelvic sonography, and pelvic sonography will be indicative of a vascular tumor. This is, uh, you, you, once you do this, then you need to get appropriate imaging. Because of its propensity to metastasize, you want to make sure that there's no metastasis in the lungs, brain, and pelvis. Okay, so this is a choriocarcinoma, and you might look at this and you say, well, this looks a lot like uh, a, uh, a adenomyosis. Uh, and indeed, you do have uh, sort of uh, this intramural thickening. It does look somewhat, when you look at it from here, uh, it does look 
somewhat like adenomyosis. The difference between this and adenomyosis is that adenomyosis will not have an elevated HCG. Okay, so this is uh, a sort of focal uh, intramural uh, tumor. And you can see on Doppler here that there's very rich vascularization. And that's uh, always going to be seen with the choriocarcinomas. Very, very vascular. Remember, this is a tumor of placental tissue, so it's going to be very vascular. All right. So the treatment is chemotherapy. I did read from one source you can treat stage 1 with methotrexate, stage 2 to 4 uh, with uh, with multi-agent chemotherapy, uh, but some sources indicate that you should do low risk with single agent and then the high risk with multi-agent. I wouldn't worry too much about that. So stage one uh, can be treated with methotrexate, stages two through four, multi-agent chemotherapy. This is the exact same chemotherapy regimens that are recommended for uh, persistent invasive moles. You're going to follow this up the exact same way you follow up persistent invasive moles. Uh, because this is associated with a high HCG, HCG is a great tumor marker uh, and will help you assess the response to chemotherapy. So you'll continue monitoring them with serial HCGs every week until you get normalization for three consecutive weeks. Then you'll follow up with monthly HCGs for one year. The same recommendations apply uh, as far as contraception. Uh, so you want to use barrier contraception until you have three weeks of normalization, three consecutive weeks, and then you can use hormonal contraception uh, until uh, you are done monitoring your HCGs, uh, and then you want to avoid pregnancy uh, a year uh, for, for a year after chemotherapy is ended. All right, and then the last one we're going to talk about is the placental site trophoblastic tumor. This is extremely rare, so I don't anticipate it coming up on the test, but for completion's sake, we'll briefly talk about it. It's a very rare, uh, but also very malignant cancer that's derived from cytotrophoblasts at the placental implantation site. Histologically, you won't see any villi. Cytotrophoblasts are going to be the only cells you see. These cytotrophoblasts invade the myometrium, but very rarely do they spread beyond the uterus. When they do spread beyond the uterus, however, there's a very poor prognosis. Unlike the other malignant GTDs that we talked about, uh, the persistent invasive moles, choriocarcinoma, those are very sensitive to chemotherapy. Placental cytotrophoblastic tumor, not so much. So... Uh, the, the one thing that a patient has going for them if they have this tumor, the PSTT, is that it does not spread outside the uterus very fast. However, it does not respond very well to chemotherapy. So you can imagine if it gets outside the uterus in the minority of cases where it does, very poor prognosis. If it remains in the uterus, that's a good thing because we can remove the uterus, and that indeed is the treatment. Uh, so the clinical presentation here is chronic persistent regular bleeding occurring weeks to a years after pregnancy. It may be very long after the pregnancy. What happens is the uh, little remnants of the placenta stick around in the uterus and then uh, become uh, malignant. So in physical examination, you may note an enlarged uterus, but there's not a whole lot here um, as, far as, uh, as far as physical exam findings. It doesn't bleed. Remember that this is a tumor derived from cytotrophoblasts, so you're not going to have an HCG elevation. So for diagnosis, it's going to be pelvic sonography. And pelvic sonography may demonstrate a heterogeneous uterine mass. It is not going to be as vascularized as the choriocarcinoma. Uh, you will probably see some invasion of the uterine wall, but it's not so common for it to get outside the uterus. You may draw HCG levels uh, to exclude choriocarcinoma, but it should be pretty easy to differentiate this from choriocarcinoma by getting that pelvic sonography and looking at the Doppler and seeing that this is not a very well vascularized tumor. But HCG levels are cheap to get, um, and so for completion's sake, you might just do that. HCG levels will be low, less than 100 uh, micro international units per mil, whereas with a choriocarcinoma, it's going to be thousands and thousands. The treatment for PSTT is hysterectomy. That's the best treatment choice because it's not very responsive to chemotherapy. You've got a big bulky tumor there. Chemotherapy doesn't do a whole lot. If you do a hysterectomy, you've removed the tumor. Because this doesn't spread outside the uterus very easily, 
uh, it's uh, likely that you can cure the cancer just by doing that. Um, now that said, chemotherapy is going to be initiated after the hysterectomy because just in case there are micrometastases you want to eradicate it. Uh, and so you'll use the uh, EMACO regimen, and this is atopicide, methotrexate, uh, dactinomycin, or actinomycin D. Uh, those are the ones that you use uh, most commonly. And then with the PSTT, typically you use two more agents, uh, cyclophosphamide and oncovin or vincristine. Uh, some Oncologists will use this regimen for the other cancers we talked about uh, when using chemotherapy, but you do want to use this five-agent chemotherapy for the PSTT because, like I said, it's not very responsive to chemotherapy, so the more drugs you use, the better. Okay, so remember that gestational trophoblastic disease, uh, the malignant gestational trophoblastic disease is a, uh, is a sequelae of a minority of cases of the benign disease, so when you have a question, uh, definitely look for a history of a molar pregnancy within the past year. This particularly follows the classic or complete molar pregnancy. Um, about 15% will go on to develop the persistent invasive mole. Uh, a smaller minority will develop a choriocarcinoma. The PSTT is quite rare. Persistent invasive moles and choriocarcinomas can be followed uh, with an HCG. Uh, but placental cytotrophoblastic tumors cannot because these are solely tumors of cytotrophoblasts. All right, if you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I'll see you in our next lecture.